Thanks. Excellent. And here we go. All right. So um, uh, let me just quickly introduce um, the PSG. That's uh, the peer support group. And we support writers um, and uh, researchers who want to publish their work. Now, I wanted to first uh, remind you of or tell you about the house rules. Um, please keep yourself muted um, at all times uh, until um, literally asked to say something or until it's question time, which I will inform you of in a minute. Um, please make sure to follow the JALT rules of conduct. We want everybody to enjoy and have a good time uh, and learn something. Um, and uh, I've already uh, informed you of the recorded sessions options, which is you can turn off your video if you'd like, because this session is recorded, or you can change your name as well. All right, so uh, a quick word about our support and sponsors, the Student Peer Interaction Network, uh, Subcommittee Ibaraki Chapter, Jolt Call, she's Woka Chapter, and um, once again, Ibaraki Chapter, yes. All right, so I'm gonna speed through this because I want Daniel to talk. You are not here to hear me. So um, the roadmap, so a little bit of introduction about uh, the PSG, which I've already done a bit. Uh, Daniel's uh, introduction, Daniel's workshop. Questions, please, at any time, type it in the chat box. Um, you'll get uh, a chance to receive Daniel's answers at the end of his um, session. Um, if there's more time, we'll have a live Q&A as well, and you can use the raise hand feature at that time. But please keep yourself muted uh, throughout. Okay. Um, wrap up will be just a reminder of our next sessions. Okay, so who are the PSG? We are a committee of JALT volunteers and people who like to read academic manuscripts, and we hope to give constructive feedback to authors who are hoping to publish. Um, the types of submissions that we have are, uh, that we look at are abstracts. We can look at your abstracts and help you with that, rough drafts of your manuscript, and of course, the final product. Um, if you want some eyes on those, we can help you with that. For more information, you can visit the JALT Pubs uh, org PSG, and you can use this QR code if you'd like. Thank you very much. And then I would like to quickly introduce our speaker because that's why you're here. Uh, Mr. Daniel J. Mills is an associate professor at Ritsumeikan University and a co-editor of Call EJ. Um, he has a master's in TESOL uh, from Shenandoah University. Um, and his, uh, sorry, um, and of course his, uh, doctorate from Instructional Technology at the University of Wyoming. His research interests, which we will hear about hopefully today, informal learning, mobile assisted language learning, technology acceptance, and financial literacy education. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, stop sharing here. And I would like to ask Daniel to take over. We are okay. looking forward to hearing from you. Okay, let me just move this over here, get started. Oh, that didn't work, did it? Oh, <laughs> Are you seeing it yes. right? Is it correct? Okay, yes. great. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So um, yeah, today's presentation is authors nuts and bolts and tips on how to be a better academic writer and maybe a writer in general. So. I wanted to start off today um, by telling you a little bit about myself, because I think I had sort of a unique journey uh, to become uh, or to come where I am now. And I hope that that might speak to some other people that maybe are not, um, uh, you know, following the traditional path to becoming an academic. So um, I actually wasn't very good at school. Uh, I almost flunked out of high school. And uh, right after I graduated, I joined the Marine Corps um, because I, I had no interest in being in another classroom uh, for another four years. Uh, unfortunately, I got injured while I was in the Marine Corps. I came out and again, followed kind of a winding path. I went to school as a massage therapist to become a massage therapist. I was a martial arts instructor for a number of years. 
And, uh, you know, I just thought that I, I liked learning, but I wasn't any, you know, academically gifted to do well at school, but I did want to earn a degree. I saw the, you know, the, the potential in that. And so I wanted to do it. And I went back to school and I found that, you know, my life experience helped a lot. Having the discipline of the military and whatnot, I, I did well in, in community college courses, but I really didn't have it all together. And where that came was when I started at my four-year university, and I quickly became friends with uh, a couple of students that were uh, pre-med. And these are kids that, you know, did well in school. And I, I started to study with them. And what I found out was that it wasn't, you know, they were smart, of course, but really a lot of it was the strategies they used. And, and nobody had taught me that. Nobody had taught me how to study, um, how to write notes in class, how to re rewrite your notes after class, what to do with that material. And so when I learned that, I excelled academically. I got my bachelor's degree, my master's, my doctorate. Um, you know, I did really well. And I, when I got out of my doctorate degree and started my journey in academic writing and publishing, I realized that just like studying in university, um, there are strategies to do it. And so that's really what I'd like to share a little bit with you today, kind of going through my path and when I ran into roadblocks and then what were the strategies I learned from people who had, who had gone before me that really helped me to become a, a, a better writer? And, I, you know, of course, I'm not the top academic in my field, but in the last 10 years, I've published about 30 journal articles and book chapters. Um, and I am now, as uh, was said, the editor of com the Computer Assisted Language Learning Electronic Journal. Uh, so I get to read a lot of academic works that are coming in and, of course, continue to produce on my own. So wh where I'd like to start is um, actually, oh, doesn't want to go forward. There we go. Um, I'd like to find out a little bit more about you. You know, I, we have quite a, a turnout today. Um, we don't really have time for a breakout room or at least enough of them right now. So I'd like to start maybe in the chat. Um could you share where you are in your academic journey? Uh, are you in graduate school? Are you thinking about graduate school? Have you already started publishing and you just want to improve and pick up some some more strategies? So maybe we could take a minute or two just to to tell us where you are in that journey. And I hope I can actually see that while still sharing my screen, but. <laughs> Oh, so I see something came up in chat. That's good. Oh, there we go. Okay. Great. This is kind of what I was hoping to see. I'm seeing a lot of people that are either just starting a master's or thinking of a master's or getting started, uh, because that's really where I have sort of put this presentation together uh, at when I was starting my graduate school. Um, see, of course, a couple more advanced people here who have already published. That's great. Okay, well, I will keep an eye on that, um, but let's, let's move forward to the next part and hopefully I can tailor it a little bit to your situation. So, um, before we get into the actual nuts and bolts of writing, the first step in research is coming up with an idea. And this was the reason I wanted to put this in is this was a real struggle for me, especially when I did my doctorate. Uh, I I didn't know what to write about, you know, and, and that's really the first step. And when you haven't done research, it can be a daunting task. Luckily, uh, at least for me, um, I was doing an EDD and, you know, probably 30, 40 years ago, the EDD and the PhD were quite different degrees, but they've sort of merged a little bit more, much more similar uh, than they were. But one of the differences for the EDD, at least in my program at University of Wyoming, was that the research needed to be problem-based. It wasn't theoretical. And this is the place I always tell new researchers to look at. Look at their classroom, look at their peers classroom look at the academic environment they've in they're in 
and look for problems, issues, phenomena that are happening there. Just something, uh, you know, as an example, I noticed, and, and maybe this is unique to me, and that's part of doing research, but when I came back to university after COVID, I um, wasn't expecting the students that I got. Um, they had changed, uh, at least from my experience teaching at Ritz-Macon University prior to COVID. The students that came were more tech savvy. That was a big one. They were um, more motivated uh, and they were nicer to each other. I, I thought that was a big one. And it got me thinking. I was talking at a conference to some other American teachers and they had a very different experience. Many of the students that started off with them were really um, uh, very quiet. They, they weren't used to engaging with people. And so right there, you see a little bit of a problem or a situation that you could turn into a research project. So that's the type of thing that you want to look at in your classroom. The questions you have are probably going to be interesting to other people as well. Another uh, way to look at for ideas, and this is something that isn't done very often, but when you're reading research, I know that when I have the conclusion, I always write about the limitations of the study that I've done. Uh, maybe I didn't have enough participants. Maybe it was done at a private university where the students are of a higher socioeconomic status of other students that you want to look at. So by reading somebody else's research and seeing what they didn't do and what they're thinking is the next step for their research is something that you could work with as well. Many of the research projects I have done are, are um, in my field, but done in a different country. So, you know, somebody uh, does a, a study on uh, mobile learning in the United States. We all know that our Japanese students are, are going to be a very different group to look at. So keep that in mind when you're reading research. What are the areas that uh, that weren't studied already? And what is the author telling you needs to be looked at next? So that's a, a great way to start. Now, um, as I said, we may or may not have a lot of time for some of these activities, but I thought here with this first activity, um, I'd like you to think about a few of those things. You can put it in the chat if you'd like, or maybe just write on a piece of paper if maybe you want to keep it secret. You, you think there may be some potential there. Um, but let's take a minute or two to think about some of these uh, uh, brainstorms of ideas that we could turn into research. Um, and while I do that, I'm just going to go to the chat really quick and I'm going to share with you. I might just turn it off for a second. I want to go into the chat um, because I'm going to share with you really quickly um, a Google Drive folder that we're gonna use for some other activities. So let me, so just take note of that link that I'm sending right now, and we'll use some of those as we go on, okay? So did you come up with any ideas? Anything that's going on in class that you'd like to look at? Okay, so keep those in mind as we go through the next parts of uh, of the presentation, because it's always good to have an idea of something that you're researching and then see how you can apply um, these activity, these uh, techniques to what you might be looking at. So now we're going to get into the, the nitty gritty of writing, uh, the joy of writing. Um, I was when I started to put this together. I was thinking to myself, you know, I, I heard a quote that said something, I don't like to write, but I love having written. And I think everybody who's written anything can, can really relate to that. And I looked it up. I thought it may be someone famous. And it actually turns out it was an interesting story. It was a amateur writer, uh, probably from about 100 years ago. And she won a contest and a reporter asked her this question of, does she like to write? She said, I don't like to write, but I love having written. And it's kind of carried on. I think it's been repeated by a lot of other people. Um, so how do we get started with writing? So, you know, when I was uh, starting out, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll back up just a little bit to tell you why I called this brick by brick. Uh, when I was in university, a friend of mine who is now an academic himself, 
um, he started lifting weights and he, he wasn't very big, of course, in the beginning. And uh, one of the little jokes he used to do what, every time he lifted weights is he'd come over and he'd say, brick by brick, the castle is made. <laughs> and it was just a little joke and we all laughed at it. But it really stuck with me because pretty much everything is like that, right? You know, how do you get started writing and how do you build on your successes? And as I was starting my dissertation, this was a real struggle for me because I, I, I just felt so overwhelmed. And luckily, I discovered a, a book and it was called Write Your Dissertation in 15 Minutes a Day. It's by Joan Bolker, I believe is how you pronounce her name. And um, I remember showing it to a few of my friends who were also in programs and they kind of laughed it off. They said, you can't write a dissertation in 15 minutes a day. But just like Tim Ferriss's four hour work week, it's kind of just a catchy title. And what her idea is, is that to, to write something large, like a dissertation, you start with 15 minutes a day. You start by creating the habit. And if you can get yourself to do that, on a daily basis, it will eventually become something that you put a lot more time into. And that's exactly what happened to me. So I started with that 15 minutes a day. One of my favorite books that's come out in recent years is called Atomic Habits. I'm not sure if anybody's read it. It's by a guy named James Clear. And one of the things he says in that book is it is better to do less than you'd hoped than to do nothing at all. And he talks about, you know, if you're doing, if you want to exercise, it's better you did one push up in a day than not do any exercise. You know, if you're uh, going to read something, it's better that you read for a couple of minutes a day. And just by setting that habit on a daily basis, it will lead to something bigger. And so that's something that's really helped me, uh, not just in that, but other things of life. I, I, after COVID, I gained like 10 kilos and I've been trying to lose weight. And I, I found it so hard to get back into working out. So I just set myself little goals, you know, just a few minutes of some exercise or just making sure my breakfast was, uh, you know, uh, more perfect in terms of calories or something. And those things have led to bigger, bigger goals, right? Now, um, I have no financial affiliation to it, but one of the trackers that I use is this habit tracker called done. And I found it to be really helpful. There's a lot of other ones that you can experiment with. Uh, but this is one way that I've gotten myself to start to commit to habits over a period of time. Um, you can see on the third picture there, that's, that's the main interface. And you can set these little um, habits that you want to create each day. And you can set the frequency of them, how many times a week or how many times a day you do it. And I've been able to use this not just to get myself back into researching and writing, but also to start meditating and uh, doing a lot of other things. So this is one thing that I, uh, um, I would recommend is to look for a habit tracker. And while this one is, it's very inexpensive, uh, it is a paid uh application. There are free ones, of course, and even a spreadsheet works. Oops. Um, the next issue that I ran into is once I got started writing and I really had this idea, uh, you know, down and I, I wanted to go further with it is writing the literature review. Anybody who's written a literature review, I think pretty much finds this one of the most daunting tasks. Um, I, I don't know if he's here tonight, but one of my my co-editor and co-author on many papers, um, uh, Dr. White, is is probably here. And we've had several papers that we've never published just because we couldn't get ourselves to write the literature review. So, um, you know, this happens to, to everybody, everybody, but there are ways to tackle that. The first thing that I learned about when I was struggling with this in, in my uh, doctoral prog program was about um, reference managers. So I used Mendeley when I was doing my doctorate. And these programs allow you to store the actual article where you can take your notes. There's all sorts of different functions that allow you to you know, keep track of different themes. But it also, when you're writing, you can input these references. And of course, references um, can be very, very difficult. Uh, to get right, especially in a dissertation when you might be looking at a hundred or, or more uh, that are used and have to be used properly throughout the um, throughout the paper. 
However, even when I used this, it didn't really click for me because I was reading so much, but how do you synthesize it into a story? And that's what I struggled with. And the professor that was working with me, my advisor, she was one of these sort of naturally talented academics. And she didn't have a problem. She never understood what I was I was dealing with. But after I talked to a few other people, uh, they started to tell me about creating a literature review matrix. And this changed my life. And the few people I've told this to that do literature reviews have said, this is so great, you know, and the example I'm going to show you right here, and I do have another example, which I'm going to point you to. Uh, this is actually a health science one. So it's not really in our field, but it gives you a good idea. Um, if you can see it closely enough, you can see that this page here basically summarizes the articles that this person is looking at. Um, I take it a step further where I have a summary page, but then in the tabs, in Google um, Google Sheets, I actually break it down into themes. And that's where I store my quotes and my paraphrases. So when I'm doing my literature review, every time I'm reading an article, I'm marking it up, I put it in here so I have a summary, and then I start to take the parts of it and put it into the themes that are gonna make up my literature review. And when you're ready to write, it, it's so easy because it's all laid out in a logical order. And so I'm just gonna um, direct you, we're gonna stop for a second on this slides. Um, and I want to show you, just open up here and I've sent you the link here so that you can find it. This is the uh, activities that I have here. Um, and there's an example literature review matrix. I hope everybody can see that. And I know it might be a little bit small. Let me see if I can make it a bit bigger so you can see, okay? And I've tried to make this really simple here. I didn't put, I took a, a literature review matrix that I used for an article I've recently written. And I only put two articles in there just so you can see how it works. Um, in my case, instead of, I didn't, uh, you know, there's many ways to do it. I didn't create a summary of the reference, but what I did include is the citation. Um, I have the abstract over here, so you understand what it's about. And then I just started taking notes. So these are the quotes and paraphrases that were coming up in the article that I thought were important for my topic, right? And then what I do um, is that I start to look for themes. So um, if you look at these themes, you can see this is about online learning, these are about affordances to do with online learning. Access is also an important function. So I look at this theme and I might say, well, we're gonna have a, a subheading here, which is online learning. Okay, I know that's gonna be in there. And then I look, you know, what, what's going on next? Here, we're talking about instruction, uh, institutional support. I have that in several areas. So I might make another theme here um, institutional, Let's see if it fits in, institutional. right? And then I start the process of looking at these items that I have, got one in online learning, I'll copy it, and then I'll move it over here. Um, and of course, I'll add the reference in there as well, so I know what I'm talking about. But this is the process that I've used to kind of create these literature review matrices. And you can see a lot of examples online. So you don't have to just look at mine, um, but you'll start to see the ways that you can use these. And every time I, you know, sometimes I, I get caught up, I don't write it. Uh, I don't go through this whole process because I think, oh, you know, it's gonna take me so much time. But when you take the time to do this, it it's just a totally different world, okay? So let me go back to my presentation real quick. So after we've uh, done our literature review matrix and we have, you know, the background of our study, that's when we're going to start mapping out our project, right? So this is really project planning. And again, I want to share some things that I, I was terrible at this. And I think it's one of the reasons that I was so bad at school. Uh, 
I just, I was, uh, you know, I liked learning things, but I just didn't know how do you organize everything? How does everything go together? And I, I didn't have any role models to, to sort of show me that. So as I started working on this, especially again in my dissertation, one of the first things that I uh, came across was a book, which is mostly a business book called Getting Things Done. It's written by David Allen. And you'll see in the files, I've actually included a reading list so that you can see how this is done. But the basic idea of it is that, um, first of all, you cannot rely on your memory to remember everything that's coming in. We're, we live in an information society and there's just too much information coming at you all the time. And that's especially true in academics. Um, so the first step of the uh, of the process is to capture what is coming in. Now, this could be simply, simply a notebook if you're an analog person. Um, it can be, and I'll show you the, the tools I use, but I, I like a Mac. So I use the note function on Mac and I've set it up into several categories. So I have, you know, my Ritzamecon notes. I have my research notes. I have my personal notes and everything that comes in I don't try to remember it. I write it down. And, and one of the best things for that, I, I suffer from a little bit of anxiety and it's gotten worse as I've gotten older. And one of the things I've found is that this helps immensely because when you take things off your mind and put it down, it's it, you don't have to think about it anymore. So that's the first step. The second step and the third step is to clarify these items to figure out what are they? Are they tasks? that I can complete? Can I do them in one step? Are they projects that are multi-steps? And then how do I organize that into something that I can take action on? And then step four, this is really important, is you need to review this system at a set interval. Um, because you could set everything up and then you don't check on it and you don't and you forget to do tasks, right? So I have a thing where every day I look through my tasks, I look through my my system, so I know what I have to do and what I can take action on. And then finally, of course, we have to engage in the tasks. And uh, one of the things he really says you should do is that if something is going to take only a few minutes, do it right away. So, you know, it, a lot of times we put things off that just are a few minutes to so just get it done. And as I said, um, I basically use the three apps that come with your, your Mac um, to set up my whole getting things done system. I record everything into my notes. I create lists of reminders, everything, you know, again, like Ritz and Macon, research, personal. And what's put in those reminders is there's a project page that has all the steps. But in the list stage, in the reminder stage, it just has the next task, what's the next step? And so I can just go in there, I complete the next step and then I move it over. And then I use my calendar for anything that has a set date. If something has to be done by a certain date, then I put it in a calendar. If it's something that I can do, you know, take me, uh, you know, over several weeks, I can put it in the reminders. Um, but there's, it's a really good system to look into. I pair that with, another system, which is called the 12 week year. And this is another book I recommend you to read. And I think a lot of academics don't read these books because they're business books. And if you're not into that sort of field, you may not read it uh, because you don't think it's related to academics, but there's so much that can come, you know, can cross over. In the 12 week year, one of the things the authors say is to be truly effective with your daily activity, you must align with your long-term vision, your strategies, and your tactics. And so while getting things done gives us sort of a system, it doesn't really define what these things are that we're doing. And there's really two sort of what they call indicators or goals that we have that we can set up. The first are lag indicators. These are the end results. So I gave an example here. You, you set a goal. And of course, if you had more room, I didn't on the slide, but you'd set a SMART goal, right? You want to make sure that it has, it's going to be completed in a certain, it's going to be very specific, it's time uh, constrained, and very, uh, we know what the ending is. So in two weeks, I will complete my literature review. That's a lag goal. It doesn't happen right away. 
But then what are the actions that I'm taking on a daily or weekly or even monthly basis that are getting me there? So I might set as a habit that I'm going to spend 30 minutes a day, five days a week, reading and synthesizing literature. So this is a really key thing that I found because a lot of times when you put something off and you say, okay, I need to write a literature review and I'm going to have it done in two weeks. It's hard to do that, right? You put it off for other things, something comes up. But if you set yourself a habit every day that will lead to that outcome, it's it's really a, a good way to go. I Again, like, you know, as I'm trying to lose weight, one of the things that, or, or try to get in better shape, one of the things I've realized, it's really hard to concentrate on a number of uh, kilos you're losing or or being better at some exercise. But if you set a small goal every day, it's going to take you there anyway. And you don't need to think about this larger goal that's looming. Um, so, you know, if we bring it back to getting things done, the way that I do things is I'm using this getting things done system to capture the information. I'm then clarifying it and organizing it using this 12 week year system. So I have lead and lag indicators. And then again, I jump back into the getting things done system to review and engage. Um, there's a lot of guides out there. Even if you don't want to read the whole books, you can find YouTube videos that summarize both of these. And, uh, you know, you can use that to, to get started. But this is one thing that has really changed my academic writing. So I do have an activity for us that I was hoping to do a breakout room, but I'm looking at the time and I'm not sure if we actually have it. So I think we're going to just, um, we're going to uh, maybe not do this right away, but I will give you the resources, of course, and we can talk about it um, later. So what I was hoping to do in this activity was to see if you could come up with some lag and lead indicators for your projects, right? And, and that's the, the main thing I'd like you to take away, I think, from that is that so often we only create those lag indicators. What is the end goal? But how do we break that down into manageable chunks? And then how do we come up with daily or weekly uh, habits that will lead us to that instead of concentrating on just the big daunting goal, especially if you're in a graduate program and you're trying to write a dissertation or a thesis. Okay, so next, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about what I'm calling here borrowing brilliance. So, um, you know, again, a lot of times with um, academic writing or academic publishing, it feels like there's just so much to do and there's so much that I have to create and do myself. But what I've found is that, you know, it's really a, a team sport and there's also so much you can borrow. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, and how, you know, that could be problematic, but we want to be careful with that. But uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. But I want to first tell you a story about Stephen Krashen. Um, I, I'm pretty sure everybody here uh, has at least heard of Stephen Krashen. Um, he's a very, very famous linguist who uh, does the input hypothesis. And if anybody's ever met him or heard him speak, um, he is an evangelist for this input hypothesis. You know, he cannot be swayed uh, from it. Uh, you know, other researchers, some researchers, most, many researchers agree. Um, some, you know, have conflicting evidence and and, and this goes back and forth. But I was at Cotisel uh, probably about six years ago when he spoke. And it was uh, it, it was a really interesting situation because he was he was saying to everybody how every study that he's looked at proves what he's been saying for, what, 50 years or longer. And he kept saying this. And just when he said it, there was this loud thunderclap that went on in the background. It was outside. It started raining. And, you know, the heavens opened up and he, he stopped and he said, see, even God agrees with me. <laughs> and it was amazing that he, he was able to pick up on this so quickly. Um, but, you know, uh, it was definitely an interesting thing. But the thing that I, I think to take away from Krashen is input and not just in language, but how we can use input to really help our academic writing. And there's a lot of different ways. You know, I have a couple of pictures up here. There's somebody reading. Reading is the main way, right? You know, I mean, just reading research can help so much. As I've become an editor for 
the journal that I'm working on right now, you know, I read a lot of research and it's so, I, I get more and more ideas because I'm seeing how people are doing it and I'm seeing, um, you know, it gives you inspiration, but it also shows you how you can do it yourself. The other thing is these groups like JALT, you know, we're talking about these um, any, anywhere where you can connect with other people that are like-minded and they're interested, just talking and hearing people talk can help you so much in, in your academic writing and putting your thoughts together. And finally, um, you know, a lot of times we idolize people like Stephen Krashen or, or some of these uh, great professors, people we've read, and we think of them because we're in this field as rock stars. Um, but, you know, of course, they're completely unknown anywhere else. And they're usually so happy to help and be recognized. Um, in my early days, I was really into uh, Glenn Stockwell's work um, because you know I was doing things on mobile learning. And when I met him, I was so excited, but of course he was just equally excited that somebody was talking to him about his work and, and really helped me a lot. So don't be afraid to approach you know, even the top people in your field to get more input, to run ideas off them, to talk to them about things. Um, and then, you know, we want to, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, so much of research is done in such a structured way when we write research papers that it doesn't need to be completely your own. Um, you know, the structure of how things are set up, journals will give you the structure. They're going to give you the organization. You don't need to worry about that. Um, research designs. Uh, so often I'll look at research. I, I based my research off of a design that was done on a different subject. You know, this doesn't change the tests, the variables. It's just the type of information we're looking at. And I think one of the big things is the results section, especially if you're like me and do statistical research. Um, I remember talking to my professor when I was in my doctorate and she's like, you know, it's a set phrase that you use when you present the results. And there are sites like Laird Statistics and one of my favorite books using SPSS for Windows and Macintosh by Green and Salkin, which sounds uh, complicated, but it's just a great book that shows you how to run the tests and what to write in the end. So, you know, of course, we have to be worried about plagiarism. We have to be thinking about these things. But very often in some sections of our paper, uh, it's it's a real set phrase. So think about that at least when you're you're um, you're doing your work. And then finally, I just wanted to touch on editing the editing process. And of course, um, there's a couple of different ways that we get editing help. The first one is our friends, you know, our peers. Um, and I, I've subtitled this: How to Get Your Friends to Work for Free. Uh, one of the really hard parts of being in academics, I think, is having so many people ask you to look at their work. And that's why it's great that they have this, you know, the uh, PSG, the organization that will look at your work for you. So you don't always have to bother your friends. But I think with whoever you're asking to edit your work, there's a couple of uh, guidelines that I would suggest that you follow. One of the first ones is to be very specific in the feedback you're looking for. Um, so often, you know, I could send something off, it's a rough draft, and I just want my friend to look at my methodology. Am I, do I have this set up right? And instead I get, you know, the grammar police. Uh, you know, that's not what I'm looking for, but you have to be specific with the people you're asking. What are you looking for? Are you looking for a proofreader? Are you looking to bounce ideas? Let's see what it is and, and tell them. Also, make sure you reciprocate this in some way. I, I've had several colleagues that have asked me to do lots of work on their papers. And then when I've said to them, oh, you know, can you help me with this? They're, they're like, no, I don't have time. Sorry. <laughs> you know, and it's very shocking because uh, you think this is going to work both ways. The other one, and this seems like simple, but it's so important. Clearly label your files. This helps you and it helps other people, right? I label my files with the dates and the versions every time. And so when you send this to people, they know what version you're getting. You're not asking someone to look at something you've already looked at and you don't lose it. Um, and then, you know, there are different, as I said, there's there's groups like JALT that will look at your paper. 
there are paid services um, that will look, and some of them are more reasonable than you would think. So, you know, looking at Fiverr and Upwork, where there's academics all over the world that uh, that do this for, for a job or at least a side hustle. There's more and more technology every day, Grammarly, uh, chat GTP, things like this that can help in the writing process if it's used correctly. And then, um, you know, masterminds. And this is something that's come from I my kind of my uh, side thing. As you may have seen, I, I like personal finance education. I do some research in that. And in that field, especially in personal finance, there's a lot of masterminds that are forming where like-minded people get together and share our ideas. And so I think it, it's another thing that would be great to borrow um, in academia. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I don't 100% have time for this, but I'm just going to cover it really quickly. This is something I do and not everybody does. My wife thinks that my wife is also an academic and she does not like doing this, but it was a little tip I wanted to share. I, I'm one of these people, I can't open 20 tabs on my computer. And um, it drives me absolutely insane. And so when I'm editing, one of the things that I do is when I get a copy that's all marked up, I actually start with a fresh piece of paper, relabel it and re put everything back in and rewrite it. And for people of my personality, it works great. For people like my wife who has a hundred tabs open, she hates it. She just wants all of the information at once. I was going to show a quick demonstration. I don't have the time for that, but I will tell you that in the files that I provided, I show a short section of a literature review I wrote, a friend edited very well for me. And then I use that to produce a book chapter and I've included the finished book chapter. So you can kind of see the difference. And I think I still have just enough time. I wanted to just talk last thing about review roulette. This is when you're actually publishing as somebody who runs a journal. Um, the main thing I wanna, as a takeaway is don't be upset with the comments you get. They are all over the place, you know? Um, you can turn in an article. I've I've had, you know, reviewers that just are against some little model, like the technology acceptance model. Somebody writes something and they write a scathing review of this work just based on they don't like the model. You know, you, you cannot take this seriously. Um, there's just all sorts of opinions that go out there. We, we're trying in our journal as much as possible to systematize it and, and get it as, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, I, I can't think of it, but evened out as possible so that there's not a lot of variation. Um, but when you are getting editors back, you can always even disagree. You can come back and say, I'm sorry, I don't agree with your comment and this is why. So when you do get to that publishing stage, don't let this throw you off. Um, and then the final thing I just wanted to share is that uh, the takeaways that I've come up with is, first of all, everyone has a story to tell, even in academic writing. There isn't uh, just one way to produce academic writing. And I, I know people that I've met that said, I can't do that. I don't want to do a lot of research. You can write a review. You can do a software review. You can interview somebody famous in the field and you can produce academic writing. Journals are on all different levels and looking at all different types of research. So don't feel that you cannot contribute to the field because either you don't think you're there yet or it's not something you wanna do. There's all sorts of stuff to, uh, that you can uh, do to become a better academic writer and to contribute to the field. And finally, uh, I think the main thing that I've learned is that you need to start where you are. You can't dream about, oh, in a year, I'm going to be at this position. I'll start writing at that point. You have to start where you are and you have to take action every day. And if you do that, you're going to reach your goal. There's just no way that you're not. So I will end it right there. If there are any questions, I think I'm starting off by answering questions in the chat. Yes, please. Thank you, Daniel. May we may we offer you an applause? So Everybody, could you oh, unmute you. and uh, please give him a round of applause? Would thank you very much, Daniel. So okay. we good job, buddy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so there are actually some questions in the chat box. Um, if we would start with that, then we can go into the live question asking um, section. Is okay. that okay? 
Okay, so the first question was from from Helper. Um, uh, what kind of lit review was it that you had used as a uh, as an example in the beginning? Um, um, the the one that I with showed the matrix, was a, yeah. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, the uh, first matrix. That if I, if I can follow it up, I'm I'm Helper actually. Um, the right. the reason why I asked the question was not so much for myself, but I noticed a lot of people are doing their masters. Uh -huh. And in academia, there tend to be two basic, if I got this right, there's two basic types of, of literature review. I'm sure there are more. One is comprehensive literature review, and another is purposeful. Do you know what oh. I'm talking about? I, I do. Um, hmm. I have never, you know, I think in my field... Yeah, I think where where I usually call this is the comprehensive one is sometimes called a systematic review. Okay. And if if I'm I hope I'm talking about the right the right thing. And and um basically, if you look at a systematic review, it, it it's a type of research paper you can write. Uh and it is research itself. There's data. So basically what you're doing is you're saying these parameters, I am searching all articles from 19 99 to 2021 that contain these keywords and you're you're just getting everything and then usually you're setting that up into sort of a matrix that's presented in a paper and it's very popular in health science because what they want to do is they want to see what all the literature like say something like you know should we eat carbohydrates is that a better diet for for, for blood pressure or something like that. They want to see what all the studies say. So that's systematic. You don't usually see that um, in our field, but there are, you could produce, I've seen it, especially for tech, ed tech type stuff. So yeah, so this one is more of the, um, what was the second one you said? Comprehensive and- um, And purposeful. No, the comprehensive, the comprehensive, what you just called um, systematic, systematic, also known as um, meta, meta studies. Yeah. Uh, Stockwell, Glenn Stockwell did one for, um, for he, he chose one journal and looked at all of the journals and he said, okay, what are the trends within this mm -hmm. particular journal? Yeah. So, yeah, so that's what the systematic, like you're saying, is usually a study in itself, whereas a purposeful yeah. one is within a broader study. So I think I was pretty much presenting more of a purposeful one. However, there are some really good books on systematic uh, literature reviews. And I, I'm, I'm really into data like that. So I, I, I hmm. kind of like them. That was a great question. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Hey, um, thank you very much. Then there's another question from, um, sorry, I'm, I'm gonna go in order. Um, so Jeff asked, um, could you give us a definition of lead and lag in academia uh, rather than business? Oh yeah, so I mean, uh, for example, I think I, I gave one that's in there where, um, like if you're going to set, let's see. So, so yeah, if I'm going to be writing a paper, let's say, so, and I set up a section of the paper that I'm going to write and I, I give myself three weeks to write the literature review. Um, that is the lag indicator. So three weeks from now, I will have a completed literature review, but then what are the things I'm doing on a daily basis? That would be. Um, you know, every day I'm spending 30 minutes reading articles and then synthesizing them into a literature review matrix. So, yeah, so like the long term goal is the lag and then the lead is the daily or weekly tasks that you do to reach that goal. I hope that's enough. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Thanks there's... for that. To that. Appreciate it. Um, well, for the next question, then, um, from Angelina, um, do you know Obsidian? And would that be something you can use for lit review? Obsidian? I do not know that. Um, uh, Obsidian, sharpen your thinking. I've just pulled it up real quick. So is this, ah, this looks really interesting. Okay, so this is kind of a mind mapping uh, system. I've never used this, but I'm definitely going to take a note and look at this. Um, yeah, I, I, I will say, um, I don't know if anybody's done it. I don't do a lot of qualitative research, but there's a, a program for qualitative research called Envivo. And Envivo 
takes like, you know, recordings of interviews or, or transcripts and you can mark it with themes throughout and color code it and do all this stuff. And then you can pull up those specific quotes or whatever it is. And I know there's a lot of people that use it to write literature reviews. So they write their notes in there and then theme it. And then it sort of puts it into more of a data. So that's one way to do it. But I really like this Obsidian. Um, and I'll definitely take a look, but I've never used it now. It's great. Okay. I'm going to make a note of that. I'm going to make a note of that in my Mac notes as part of the getting things done system. <laughs> Is that okay, okay Angeline? Yeah. Are you all right? Yes, uh, sorry, just to jump in. Thank you for um, answering. This is basically a system where you can take notes of, uh, an, it's a note-taking system where you can organize it based on themes. Um, and there's, a, like you said, there's a mind mapping um, tool as well. So uh, on YouTube, there, there's a lot of videos where people walk you through uh, the use of this application for research and for writing. So I wondered if oh, wow. you'd be interested in that. I'm I'm so happy you told me about it because it looks really, really great. I definitely want to try it out. Um, yeah. I put my email on the end. So if you do have any videos or something that you'd like to share, please send those to me. All right. Thanks. All right. And thank you, Jane, for putting the, the link in the chat box. If you're interested in Obsidian, please have a look. Um, Okay. Are there any, we have a few minutes left. Are there any people who would like to ask live questions? Please use the raise hand option. I'll check and see if I see anyone. Hmm. Any questions? I, I saw there was one more question actually from JP Rodriguez. Okay. Um, and I'm I'm sorry to tell you I I'm not familiar with the la is it LaTeX or LaTeX or Overleaf. I've never used those for. Um, but again, I'm going to take some notes on that. I've always just used Microsoft. Um, so I unfortunately I don't have an opinion on those. Actually, I have a question for not for for Daniel, but for for everybody else that, that's listening. Um. There, there's a lot of people that seem to be very interested in like either writing or collaborating. I was just curious, like, how are people collaborating? How are people finding um, collaborators to do research? So maybe, um, Daniel, you've collaborated on numerous mm -hmm. papers. How yeah. did you, how, how did you set that up? Um, a lot of it was meeting people at conferences. Um, so yeah, just going to conferences, presenting my research, I'm collaborating with a actual, a, a lab in China, um, that, you know, I met a professor, she liked some of my work. So, you know, she asked me to collaborate. Um, I, I, there was a student at university of Hawaii who used a model that I created to do his dissertation. So I was able to collaborate with some people there. Um, so yeah, it's just been, it's just been through networking, um, uh, one one danger to that that I can say is that you end up getting so much uh, offers and, and and things that it's hard to you end up taking on too much. But yeah, it, it especially pre COVID, it was a lot of networking. But I know that you know now there's a lot of online networking. Thank you very much. Okay, there's another question uh, from Berlinda. Um, she would want, she would like you to please explain the literature review matrix again. How do you organize the notes around the themes? Could you kind of summarize yeah. that? So let me just, uh, I can actually pull it up again. So I kind of did this one hastily here because I was trying to get the timing. Um, but let me see if I can pull this. Okay. Yeah. So the themes are what emerge from your notes, right? So as I um, as I start working through, so as I said, like this first one, this is actually my advisor for my doctorate, and I really like her research, and I'm familiar with it. But um, she, um, so as I was reading through it, I was either quoting or paraphrasing, and I just this is everything. This is not theme based, right? So 
I saw this line that she wrote, you know, about affordances of online learning. And then, um, yeah, these are all about affordances. So I start seeing these, these words, affordances, right? And that starts to create a theme. I think, well, maybe there's other things about that that I, I could do, but it's, it's really more art than science. As you see these key phrases coming up, institutional support, um, you start to put them together into these themes and, and then just start fitting in the quotes or the paraphrases into these tabs that I've created where um, I'm gonna only put that theme. And one thing, this is not a finished work. So I might create an online learning tab and start putting things into it. And then I find out, wait, there, it's I can't just write about online learning. Maybe there's gonna be online learning uh, like asynchronous online learning and then another one which will be synchronous and I'll separate those two. Um, so it's kind of a work in progress, but the, the main point that I do is just record everything that I see and then it gives me a little bit of a visual to put it into these themes that I sort of see emerging. But again, with some of these other like Obsidian or whatnot, there may be ways to uh, to do that more systematically, like where you can use search terms to find them. Um, and, you know, AI is one way to do it. I, I've experimented with it where you can put in to say chat GTP and you put in all the quotes you have and you can say what themes are here and it can give you a starting point. Now, obviously you don't want to just take it wholeheartedly, but you know, it can give you a starting point of themes that could be set up and then you can, it, it gives you somewhere to look and to categorize it. So I hope that answers it. Um, I don't know if I do that perfectly, but that's the way I do it. I think there's time for one final tiny question. And then uh, unfortunately we, we have to wrap up, uh, but thank you so much for all your questions. Um, the question from Angelina, do you create a new Excel doc for, with the literature review for every research paper you write? Uh, yes, but I do copy and paste a lot. <laughs> so I, I just wrote a paper that was about online. Um, it, it was about, uh, it was a quantitative paper about teachers attitudes towards online learning, something like that. It was kind of psychological issues. And then um, we're doing a qualitative version. So the lit reviews are very similar. There's just a few differences. So a lot of it's just copy and pasted over. But yeah, I try to keep a different matrix for each one um, just to keep it simple. And I use Google Sheets. Um, so then it's easy to share with everybody. And you know, I just want to end really quick with that in terms of please look at the link that I put in here. I'll put it in, maybe I can do it one more time uh, just yeah. to make sure everybody has it. Um, but there is other material in there that you might find helpful, um, uh, you know, showing some of my paper and, and other things like that. And even a reading list that has all the books I mentioned. Um, and, you know, if you have any questions, just feel free to email me. We can always set up a Zoom uh, you know, if somebody wants to talk or if a group wants to talk and um, yeah, I'm happy to help. Hey, thank you so much, Daniel. And can I ask oh. everyone for a round of applause again? Thank you so much for a wonderful Shh. presentation. Uh, I learned a lot as well. Um, if I can just make a final comment, um, I would like to thank our sponsors again, uh, Jalt Ibaraki, uh, the Shizuoka chapter, the Jalt Call, and um, Spins. Uh, and thank you, Natsuho, for hosting. Um, I would like to ask uh, everyone who's still here to actually fill out a survey to tell us what you thought of Daniel's presentation. If you don't mind, the link is in the chat box. Um, if you don't have time now, I will send uh, a link uh, by email as well. But thank you so much for attending our first uh, session in this uh, PSG PD series. We hope to see you again at one of our next sessions. Um, and uh, please do contact Daniel if you have any more questions. Uh, and if you have difficulty doing that, you can contact him through us as well. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's eight o'clock exactly. Um, have a lovely evening and a good week.
and hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for Thank coming. Thank you, Daniel. Good job, Daniel.